Okay, um, I feel very pleased to be here in Serbia and um, talk a little bit about um, what we do in our company. Um, so, my name is Dennis Meyer. I'm system architect of AdTech, which is an ad serving company. Um, we are an AOL company. Um, yeah, I think the uh, title says it all Map Reduce in Action, um, large scale reporting based on Hadoop and Vertica. Um, so, what does it talk about? Um, Everybody's talking nowadays about big data, about clusters, and all of those new, new SQL, no SQL um, solutions. And um, yeah, who's really doing it right? So I don't know that many companies who really have kind of made the right step into that. Um, so we also try to do it, right? Um, I think it, it looks easier than it really is, so there's a, there's a lot of issues that we encountered ourselves, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Okay, who's AdTech? Um, I have to admit that I hate going to a conference and there's a call who's doing a lot of advertisement about the company. The complete talk is only about advertisement. Sorry to say that, because uh, we are an ad serving company. Um, so we came from the digital advertising, which is kind of those little pop-ups that you hate if you're surfing around. Um, and um, so our main product is an ad server. Um, we've got uh, more than 500 customers worldwide, so from, from mainly everywhere. And we serve 6 billion ad impressions per day worldwide. Um, we've got four data centers, which are cap uh, coping track of all of those um, impressions. And our, our development is kind of in um, Dreieich, which is near Frankfurt in Germany, uh, where I'm coming from, um, as well as Dublin. Um, there's a little bit of Serbia here with Codecentric, so we're working with Codecentric together as well. Um, and missing, there's also some development in London. Okay, so that's a question that I'm always getting asked. So you are the guys who are doing those pop-ups. So do you program the JavaScript? No, we don't. Not 100%. Um, so we are mainly kind of building the infrastructure to take the real decision on what to show the customer, right? And just to, um, just to grab out the keynote that we heard today, uh, there was kind of the bakery thingy where, you would, where you're looking into the weather, so what, to, what the customers are going to buy. So we also have weather forecasts, for example, right? So if you want to kind of um, sell something like... Uh, an umbrella, we can do it. Okay, so that is kind of um, boiled down what we're really doing in here. So just to give you a real life example, um, the customer of ours is big publishers, big websites um, like mail providers, like um, newspapers. And what they do is normally they have their own web developers. So what they do is they build their own system, which is doing all of that logic because they have got the people to do it. So why not do it themselves? Then they start up and they recognize it's more complex. So first of all, showing an ad just like customer A on website B is really easy. But um, when it starts like that user should only see that advertisement once an hour, it's getting a big problem because you need to remember the customers. Okay, there's a solution with a cookie. Perfect, right? But if your website is growing, that's getting too slow and there's other issues as well. So normally where they end up is um, they see that a lot of their effort, a lot of their budget is going into the ad server development. So they come to us and we're doing that job. What is happening there? So we've got a website as a provider which is plain text HTML. Um, and in there there's a little um, link which is getting back to our infrastructure. So in here, it's, it's the ad server.adtech.de, and that is hitting, um, no, it's not hitting, that's open up in the browser um, of the customer, so the end user, so somebody who's just surfing on, on the newspaper side, and he opens the HTML, the link is going to our ad server. And there's also some additional parameters so we can, um, target the user a little bit better. So um, if you, for example, you need to um, uh, subscribe into your email service, you have an account, that account is bound to some parameters that could be transferred to us. 
which in that example is mail-in football. The ad server then is taking care about that. It's doing kind of the decision logic, what campaign I should show to that user. And we are returning JavaScript, an HTTP redirect, raw information sometimes if you're thinking about video players, um, and XML. So that's mainly what's happening. The browsers themselves um, then is loading the real image, which we have normally hosted on a CDN, which stands for Content Delivery Network, a big cache simply. So we're not serving um, the images on the flash and whatever directly. So that's kind of an external provider. Um, but the important part that we're talking of is down here, it's the logs. Because we're talking about six billion ad impressions um, and we need, of course, to provide that information to our customers. We need to build our customers. But some of our customers, of course, have their own customers, which is the advertiser. So if a big company like Coca-Cola is doing some advertisement on AOL website, what needs to happen is that AOL needs to pay for it because we're doing some service, as well as Coca-Cola needs to pay for it because they need to pay AOL, right? So all is about numbers, and that is what we talk about in reporting. Okay, let's talk about the technologies um, which we're talking about today. Um, so in here you're seeing uh, mainly, which is interesting for us, is Hadoop and Vertica, of course. Um, but there's also some, some more um, of, of all of that, um, I would say, tech buzz, right? And I'm not a big fan of buzzwords, to be honest. And it looks really crowded. Um, normally what we do, because we've got so many systems, is that we're trying to have a unified tech stack. Um, so each and every time that we introduce something new, we're, we're just asking, does it really make sense to go into a new direction, to introduce a complete new system? Um, wouldn't it be better to just leverage what we already have, we know how it, how it scales, how it performs? And I think that's a very important thing about, um, about that complete NoSQL thing. Because it's new technology, and a lot of people don't know what it's good for. And there's, there's not big experience there. So there's a lot of talk where it says, like, we've got those 5,000 node Hadoop cluster, okay, who of your companies can afford a 5,000 node cluster, right? I, I don't need to ask that. Um, so we try to, to keep it simple, but still there's always the right tool for the job, so we need to look into what we really want to leverage for and what does kind of complete the job. Okay, so um, that is kind of um, what we're using overall. And we'll focus on the upper part, which is kind of the reporting part, and a little bit of this in the last slides, if I'm, if I'm having time left there. Um, and of course, we're always interested in new developers. So if you're interested in working in Frankfurt, Dublin, let me, let me know. We're also looking for new people. Um, hard enough to get them. <laughs> okay, um, so let's talk about SQL, no SQL, and new SQL. Um, I like new SQL because I'm one of those guys who's really in um, relational databases and I also studied um, that. So um, I think that um, each and every system has got its strengths as well as its weaknesses. So what we normally do is if we evaluate a system, we're asking, can you do a presentation? We give it to some developer, to some teams, and they kind of do their analysis. Um, then we get a presentation. And it's pretty interesting because everybody who's looking into new technologies is pretty much bought into it, right? So um, it's natural. So if I'm looking into some new fancy technology and I've never been worked with it, I'm interested in the new stuff which is give us. I'm a tech technician guy and I like it, I like development. So I wouldn't look into it if it wouldn't be in my, in my interest. So I'm bought into it, I like it, right? And as I'm doing kind of the presentation, normally what happens is people say, it's a great product and it has got A, B, C and D of features and that's all looking great. But every system has, has got weaknesses. If you don't have three weaknesses for your system, you didn't evaluate it right. So there needs to be weakness. Um, and a very important part as well is if you evaluate, use the tool like it is designed. It might be that the tool does a job for you, for your product, but what happens if you scale up? So we are talking about um, hundreds of servers which we have in our data centers. And what's normally happening is that we start with a small product like mobile, right? And it seems like, yeah, just a 
part of the customers is really using mobile phone advertisements. And what's happening, it's growing exponentially, right? And if you don't have an answer to grow, you're getting issues. So if you're just picking a tool which fulfills the initial requirements, you'll be screwed later. And also think about things that we as developers and technician persons, and we like the new tool, right? We, we love it. Which we sometimes forget to think about, which is stability and maintenance. And of course, do we really need it? Okay, so we did kind of have our old system, which was kind of self-developed, C++, and we had scaling issues. Um, what, what we are doing mainly is we're writing out um, files for each and every ad request which our ad servers are uh, receiving into a large file. And that large file is just cut into chunks, like hourly files, and then we're, we were running a C++ program over it. We had scaling issues, so what we did was we were parallelizing it, doing it in parallel. And also here, it was too unflexible because we needed to sometimes adjust it. So we introduced something like a pseudo SQL with our own syntax. So it, it was going kind of into the right direction, but it was hard to get it running in the right way. Um, so we took the decision to completely rebuild it. Um, and the core part was how do we log the data and how do we get it into a system which we can do aggregations. And the first thing is logging the data. Initially we had kind of a binary format which we ourselves defined and we thought was pretty optimal because we were kind of um, writing all the data out in a binary format. So we would know that the first, first four bytes were, the, were an integer uh, for the campaign, the next four bytes were the integer for the banner and so on. So um, that got problems because you could not easily extend it. So when we had new business cases like mobile, video coming in, um, problem was there wasn't, it was just four fields left and we always like, yeah, does it make sense to log it? Of course, everybody said, yes, we need to log it. And what happened was, oh, we've got only four fields left. Is it that important? And the real answer is you don't know because it could be kind of the game changer for your complete company or it could be completely useless because the product might just fail and then you're eating up one of the last four fields. So we needed to have something which is more flexible. So we decided to go for Avro. Why do we go for Avro? Because we needed to have something which is pretty much optimized in space. Um, Avro is a binary format and it has compression encoding. So it, it is very small in size. Um, we needed to have something uh, where we really can serialize and deserialize in a fast manner. And um, so that's something where normally um, uh, things like protobuffers shine, or there's also Swift, you might have heard of it. Um, Avro is a little bit more Java um, oriented, um, but it also offers the same possibility. And the good thing about Avro is that it's, um, that it's self, uh, self descriptive. So it, it keeps the schema in the file itself. Um, which some other frameworks you need to pre-compile the structure of, of what it keeps track of. Um, so they call it schema awareness. Um, and the good thing about that is it is binary, it is compressed, but if you look at the file as human, you can just open it up and the first thing which will be in the header is the schema itself and the schema is encoded in JSON, so you can really read it with a normal text editor. That's, that's really nice. And um, it also has got um, a transport layer, so that it ca can also um, uh, transport messages from A to B. Um, it seems to be very Java-oriented. We, we don't use that part at all because we had our own infrastructure for that, on, at least on the ad server part. And for the rest, what we used is uh, we went for using Flume as a transport layer. Um, thinking about the transport, um, of course we're talking about Hadoop, we're talking about big data, but how how to get that big data into Hadoop. And um, we're talking about um, four data centers um, in one of the first slides um, it, it was kind of pointed out. Um, what we do is we've got two completely separated systems. It's like a copy. One is in the US with two data centers and one is in Europe with two data centers. And what we need to do is we need to, um, we need to stream all the data into one data center 
because we don't want to have two Hadoop classes and join the data later somewhere in a database, which doesn't make sense in my eyes. So we've got one data center where Hadoop cluster sits, but we need to get all the messages into that one single Hadoop cluster. And of course, we're talking about, um, I think, I'm not sure, uh, around 25 ad servers in one data center. And all of those need to kind of get the information into that one local store. So what's happening is that we looked out what solutions are out there. And there's um, Flume and Scribe mainly, which is log aggregation frameworks. Um, um, Scribe is from Facebook, I believe, and Flume was, um, I think it was LinkedIn, if I'm not wrong here. Um, pretty similar in, in functionality. We just take, took Flume because it seemed to be having direct connected to Hadoop that we could use, which didn't work out at the end, but I'll talk about that later. Um, what, what Flume does give you is you can route your messages. And you can even create cascades and, and routes. You can do copies and all of that. So, so it, has, it, it is really flexible and it has got some um, hot failover possibilities. So if one of your machines who's kind of grabbing the logs um, or taking care about the messages in our case is failing, another one takes over. So it seemed to be really nice and um, it looked to be really nice integrated into Hadoop. At the aggregation, um, I talked about the C++ program and it really looks like an Asian Hadoop. That's what I call it always. Um, because what Hadoop does it takes your file and separates it on the multiple boxes. There is a case safety, so it's, it's take care about copies, so you don't need to take care about outages, which seems to be really nice. Um, and um, you can optimize your I.O. weight, which for us was, was a big game changer because we already tried that, uh, that paralyzing. And I.O. throughput is a good thing that we need. You can scale it. Just put boxes to it. So you don't need configuration, you don't need to change your system, you don't need to program, just throw hardware at it. Perfect. The MapReduce concept is pretty flexible. Um, if, you, if you look into some tutorials how to do it, it's, it's some Java program which says I've got line input and I need to have kind of a map output, that's where it's coming from, and then you're reducing that again to a, to, to a final output. There's that famous word counter examples where you just, uh, in parallel, um, run over parts of the files, count the words, and then send it back to a central place where you just count it up. Um, but of course, doing that in a Java program is work intensive. Um, so we wanted to get it easier. And easier is, is then writing that those Java jobs in Hadoop is to use a framework. There's a few around there. Um, so uh, we are using Pig and Hive nowadays. In production, um, PIC is um, a scripting language which is producing those jobs. So it's kind of a code generator framework, right? And it's, it's um, using streams, so if you're coming from the relational world, um, it's pretty easy to adopt because there's some, some common knowledge that they're, that they're sharing as a concept. And why PIC? It's also having less code. So you're writing aggregations a lot faster. Um, and there's a second framework that we're using. It's called Hive. And what Hive is about, Hive is um, a SQL um, framework on top of it. So what's happening here is that you can use real SQL code um, to run against files. And how does it work out? So if you're talking about a file that we put on, um, on our cluster now, um, it could be that this is XML-ish, so it's got a tree structure itself. Um, Hive loves tables. Tables are flattened, right? So it's all flat. There are some extensions to it, but it's the best usage how, how to do it. So you really have something like a virtual table that you can query against, and Hadoop takes care about, um, first of all, Hive takes care about it um, to, to run the jobs, and then Hadoop takes care about running over your files, doing all those magic, like joins and all of that stuff. So it's pretty, pretty easy, and we just thought, okay, we're taking that for debugging. Um, okay, and of course, such, such a job in Hadoop, um, it needs some time to ramp up. So what happens is you're moving over a job to Hadoop, and Hadoop is then just putting it into little pieces and just running it on the complete cluster nodes. 
it needs some time to do it. So it, it, it has got a ramp up time of, of um, that's in seconds. So we're not talking about something in milliseconds like used in a database. Um, so thinking about running a report against Hadoop doesn't really make sense if using kind of Hadoop jobs. Um, so what we're doing is we're loading all of that data into Vertica. So we pre-aggregate our data, so pre-cook it, um, look at the numbers, for example, how many impressions did that banner do, how many impressions did the campaign achieve, and move that data over to Vertica. Um, we had a lot of databases before, like um, um, Sybase, um, Oracle, MySQL, um, which all somehow worked, right? It's, it's kind of very equal to each other, but um, Vertica is, is, is a lot better in keeping track of, of a really large data volume. Um, Vertica itself is a columnar database and um, it's also running in a cluster. So you've got multiple nodes and they need to be kind of the same hardware specification um, and separating the data on them. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with columnar data stores, but a columnar data store has the advantage that if you're not reading the complete row of your code um, or of your data and just pick just pick um, a few columns that you don't need to take care about the rest of the data. So indeed the data is not stored one after another, so data, data row by data row, which is normally happening in a, in a usual database, but it's keeping track of only one row, puts that into a file. Next row, next column, sorry, next column will also be kind of um, stored in its own file. And they're kind of ordered in the same order as the primary key. So if you're asking for the primary key, it's going into the primary key column file, looking at kind of, oh, that's here, the ID 100, and then going into the other files that you are asking for, so maybe <coughs> column name, and then you're going into the column name into the, same, in the, into the same row, and then you know you matched it. And that's pretty obvious that now you're having hard times doing an index, because what's happening now, um, if I'm asking for just matching a name, because that's kind of scattered data, because it's ordered by the primary key. It's pretty simple, they're just doing a copy of the complete data and sorting it by a name which makes kind of the request pretty fast, but the downside of it is that you need to kind of keep track multiple times of your data. So the data grows that you kind of have in the cluster, but the access to it is a lot faster. Also, that multiplied data is also a problem when talking about small inserts. So Vertica is not really good at really fast small inserts. That's what it really doesn't like. So it's built to have big data which you load into Vertica and that you then want to query in a fast manner like in a database. And there you can ask for single rows, that's no problem. So it seemed to be a really good fit because what we're doing in Hadoop is we're doing a large aggregation over all of our campaigns that we are running um, and we're talking about over 100,000 campaigns that are live in one system only. And um, so that, that's really nice. Um, I've been asked for some um, performance metrics. I hate that because I'm not a big fan of that. Um, um, so for our case, and I call it an apple and oranges metric because I think that is just usable for us in our use case. In that spe specific scenario, we are talking about a cluster against a large horizontal machine, uh, vertical scaled machine, which is um, kind of a big box um, running MySQL in that case against more nodes in parallel, uh, which of course is not comparable hardware, um, but it's how we implemented it. And in our case, it was five to 10 times faster than MySQL on the load, so getting the data in, which in our case was the biggest problem. Um, and uh, we replayed kind of productional reports in, in a test scenario with, um, with a kind of a performance test. And we kind of recorded 1,000 reports and run it against both systems. And we were kind of around um, 10x faster, which is not quite fair because um, Vertica wasn't kind of um, uh, tuned up to its limits uh, uh, at that day because it was kind of the initial, initial version. Um, for ad hoc, ad hoc queries, we, we looked into kind of four times better. Um, what we experienced was the more complex the query was, so uh, doing a lot of stuff, a lot of joining and all of that stuff, um, it, it was comparable better to MySQL. So if it was kind of an easy read, um, they performed more or less equal by a small factor, 
but if, you, if it's getting more complex, so the long running queries, we had some, were, it, it, some queries that run over a minute in MySQL, and that was just be there in seconds, right? Or even milliseconds. Okay, so let's talk about the architecture. How we, did we put all of that together? Um, yeah, okay, um, so on, on the left upper corner, you see that that is kind of the ad service who's producing the data. Moving over those um, information, the log records as Avro information already, so Avro encoded. Then we're using Flume to kind of um, move that data over to the Hadoop cluster. Inside Hadoop, we then have the binary log format, which is kind of the, the log information of those six billion records, for example. There's even more because there's some tracking information, like um, the video had been played, had been stopped, paused, and so on. So it, 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 it's, it's really larger indeed. And what you also need to have in there is um, some dimensional data. Um, sometimes you want to do an aggregation by a certain name, and we just keep track of IDs in our ad service because it's more performant because the ad servers keep track a lot of, of the information in memory so that they can take the decision um, really in a millisecond. Um, and in here you see that there's also temporary data, so you, we also have the possibility to kind of um, aggregate something and the output will still live in Hadoop. Okay. Then we've got Hive as well for kind of ad hoc queries um, and the output of that um, we can also store in NAS, so that is kind of um, cheaper, right? Because Hadoop, you need kind of the cluster and you need to eat up the cluster space. So if you just do it once and you need to keep track of it, why not move it out of the cluster? So you've got more space, you can keep track of more, more time of your data, more history. So we are um, storing currently 30 days of data in here. Okay, so that is how, how we use um, our Avro format. So that's a little bit more internal. Because what, what we were replacing, we were replacing um, um, some transport layer from, um, from our old ad servers by the new Avro payload. So we just exchanged the payload uh, with a new format so we can log out both information in parallel using our ad servers. Which is always a good thing if you're talking about architecture. Um, because when you're introducing a new system, you're introducing new risk. What we always try to do is we always try to run it in parallel for a certain point in time until we build up enough trust um, that we know how the system is working, how it's scaling, and then we just pull the trigger. That's just a, a small um, example how an Arthur schema is looking like, but I think uh, most of you should be familiar with JSON, so it's becoming so popular nowadays that everybody has seen it. Um, so it, it's really human readable, which is really nice. Um, extending Avro records, we um, made one master schema mainly and added um, kind of information to it. The good thing is what's happening is you normally put data in but you never remove it out. So that is kind of, we, we just did it once in the six years I've been with, or seven years I've been with ATTAC. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to add information. What we wanted to have is something where we can add information and it's not screwed up afterwards. What's happening now is that we add something to the schema and the old aggregations which are just taking care about the old data is still in place so it's compatible. So we can add new data on the fly and the old aggregations are still in place. You don't need to recode them. They so just look into, into the JSON schema. If the data is there, they just run on it. So that's really nice and it's easy to add something. And for the different teams on the different um, data that we produce, we have got something which is called a sub-record. So there's some information which lives on in, in sections in that record, so you don't need to fill out everything. But it's reusable if it's kind of um, some master information which lives each and everywhere, like time and so on. Um, versioning on a Flume source, um, that is um, kind of also important for that because you need to know about um, how to write the files out. Because if you have information um, versionized, we've, we're talking about 25 ad servers in a data center, it might be that um, you add some new information to it, so you're creating a new version of the schema. We can't do, do that all at once because we need to, to, to flip off our system and we're approximately at um, somewhere around 100,000 impressions in a second. Of course we cannot just put the complete system down for a few minutes. 
So what's happening, you're just updating one after the other. So you're writing out to different files which have different versions. That's how it's simply done. Um, so um, on the Flume sync, what you need to take care of, you need to take care of the different schemas, of course, so, so you're aware to write the different configuration. And what we ended up with, we tried to move all the data directly into Hadoop, like streaming. Yeah, it worked, but the problem is it wasn't stable because what was happening if Hadoop is down? So if Hadoop is down, um, it needs some time to come up. Um, and that kind of is a problem because it can take hours if there's corrupt files. Um, the database guys of you maybe know that you need to rerun kind of the log file, the write ahead log. The same happens to Hadoop if you've got broken files, it also needs to kind of repair all, all of that stuff. So um, in one time I can remember it was a dev cluster but um, it needed to kind of, um, I think it was like one and a half hour to come back, to, back up to speed. Thinking about that, 10 iterations of bug fixing because you might not get it um, running the first time, we're maybe talking about an outage of a day. So we wanted to keep, tr keep track of that and ended up in um, writing out a file that we then move into Hadoop because it gives us greater flexibility. That's just an example how it looks like. I'm, I don't go into details because you can do that in the net and we're short in time. Um, okay, so other storage, I think I covered that enough. Um, in in other, there's... Um, um, Avro is well supported in Hadoop, it's also from Apache, um, but there's still some functionality which they didn't code in. So there's unions, um, so they work only in the same schema, so be aware if you're going for something non-standard that um, there will be some glitches in Hadoop. And it seemed to be more better than I ever expected, and we, it ate up, ate up a lot of time that we didn't expect. So what was happening is that um, we thought, hey, that seems to be really easy, we just replace the format, and it indeed was a problem. So it's, it's getting better supported nowadays, and um, we also needed to patch something. Um, so there's a piggy bank, which is kind of the library which Pig's using, and that didn't support Avro uh, by 100%, and some of the functionality wasn't there. The good thing is, um, the developer who, who um, kind of created the patch, um, we got in touch with him, and, and that worked out plainly playing good, but, um, and we retested some of his stuff as well, but um, better test first. <laughs> okay, so let's wrap it up. Um, after lessons learned, it has structure support, built-in schemas, Java API is well supported, um, versioning works well, um, and no schema compile is necessary. Let's talk about the downsides. Um, the ad server part is C. So C is not really nice supported, so there's um, so we thought that that would be more straightforward. So there is a C and a C++ library, both would be kind of uh, possible for us. We started with the one, switched over to the other, and then found out that that wasn't even better. So um, it is really a Java-centric um, Java project, that one has to admit that. Um, and it's not built for convenient programming, so documentation and how it's built, it's not straightforward, it's not right go and use it. Um, Flume lessons learned. Um, I talked about all the great things like um, flexible data flow. Um, so the downside is um, that we thought that hot failover is a good thing. But you need to have half plus one nodes for it because it's doing some, um, I don't re remember the name, but um, that um, uh, Kova, Kova, Kova um, thingy. So the problem is we're talking about two data centers that we want to have the data flow in. It's hard if one goes down that you have more than half in the other one. So that doesn't work out. So we ended up in two dedicated data flows so that we can lock with one data flow in one data center with the other one across the data centers. We needed to use more hardware for that. Throughput looked okay, but um, now we, we kind of experienced problems um, as we're kind of scaling up by a factor of two because of a new product of ours. Um, that um, um, it's just using one core and that's kind of a problem for us right now. So we're throwing a lot of hardware on it um, and we might just um, you switch over to a different project for that. Oh, that's, that's the right one. Okay, Hadoop lessons learned. Um, so it is the most important thing is it's awful to debug. 
So if we're talking about um, SQL, um, you just have the slow query log, all is good. Look into it. You've got, um, you've got a kind of the query plan, um, some products are around it, um, so you can go out and go to some company who's got a nice uh, product who's just showing you how all of that works out. You don't have that for Hadoop. Um, and there's kind of one project which I want to uh, point out, Starfish, that looks really nice, um, but it um, is kind of a university project and it's not kind of supporting the newest version. Um, but that would be something that I would like to see. So you see in parallel what task is, is kind of executed at what point in time and gives you some, um, it gives you some hints to kind of uh, to fiddle around with the 5,000 parameters that you have in Hadoop. And that's not a joke. So you've got so many parameters you can't really try it out because once you have the cluster live, um, you cannot play around with it a lot. And that's a big problem. So you don't have an understanding what makes that, that jobs really slow. Vertica, like I said, um, it's not really well suited for small updates. Um, um, loading data with primary key, so um, that's not really um, nice implemented. So you've got um, um, keyword clashes and then the import breaks completely. Um, I think they, they kind of um, reverted that in the newest version, so they did some work on that. So it was pretty aware and everybody says, yes, everybody's complaining about that. But um, uh, be sure that you test kind of clashing keys if you import um, large data. Um, Beside of that, I think um, um, it was incredibly easy to move over from MySQL to Vertica. I was kind of um, 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 planning a lot of more time, so that was kind of the only thing which worked out faster than we really expected it in that project. Hive at hoc queries. Um, yeah, Hive. Um, we're talking about pick all the time, right? Um, at the end, it turned out that um, pick gives us a lot more value because it's a lot more simple. You can just write a query, run it against a cluster, you're done. So what we ended up with was, hey, that's really nice. And we thought we have a performance benefit using PIC. That's not the case, right? Um, there's some parts which might be better for PIC, but um, we saw a lot of value in using Hive. And we even built up a new product on it so that our customers themselves can, can put ad hoc queries on Hive. So what we have is that our customers now can ask a data management API, a data provisioning API, we renamed it in product, sorry. Um, customers of ours now can throw SQL on the data that they're producing. So what we do is we can just offer them their own logs into our infrastructure. They just have a REST API that they need to call and they can throw SQL at it, at it for kind of data analysis or if they have a daily changing business model like for today I just want to look at uh, UK traffic, for tomorrow I just want to look at um, whatever um, rest of Europe traffic which happens often in UK. So this is really nice, and um, that is kind of in the beta phase um, nowadays. But that, that just opens up a lot of flexibility that you can do with Hive. So that is really, really, really nice, and you can kind of um, keep track of a lot of business cases in a fast manner. Um, so um, in overall, um, we boiled down kind of um, um, our... Pro uh, our aggregations, the C++ programs, um, there were around 5,000 to 10,000 lines of code. Um, in PIC, we ended up with 20 lines of code. So that, that is really, really nice. Uh, we're talking about um, introducing a new report, which is reading from the Vertica database. Um, nowadays, um, it's getting um, introduced by, if, if we don't need to do um, um, a very fancy aggregation, we can do that within a week. Before we are talking about four to eight weeks, we often denied customer requests because of that. So that gives us the flexibility to really do it. Of course, there's a lot of um, work that you need to put in in advance. And we thought that would be a lot easier. Um, so we struggled a lot with that project. Um, so what's next? Um, I talked about Hive, very uh, enthusiastic. I think that we might not replace our, all of our pick scripts with it, so no doubt. But um, it gives so much additional value that we want to look more deep into it and we want to get it more real time. And there's some different projects that we're looking into currently and want to evaluate, like Impala, which is from Apache, uh, Stinger, Hawk. They all have the same idea behind it, not running only on files, but running partially on data streaming, um, so you don't need to create an intermediate file in Hadoop because it's a Hadoop job. So it just sits on top of Hadoop and does something in between. Or sometimes it's doing all of that stuff in memory, which of course fastens it up as well. 
<coughs> and there's some other interesting frameworks that um, we want to look at, um, like Storm, which is kind of kind of um, a messaging um, thingy on top of it. Um, HBase, um, that is kind of uh, in-memory uh, key value mainly, but it really nicely integrates into Hadoop. Um, and Giraffe, which is more like an, a library for running Hadoop jobs on analytics jobs. So it's kind of a graph analytics engine. So you can also kind of analyze how you traverse graphs, which for us, of course, is important because you, you want to know how the user was going through the net, right? So um, if there was some, um, um, we call it retargeting campaigns. So normally what's happening is that you first see a BMW overall advertisement. The second time is we've got our new BMW M3. And the next uh, campaign just, uh, do you want to do a test drive? And that is just like, um, of course, people paying a lot more for that money, a lot, lot more money for it, um, if you can give them the right answers. And that might kind of um, um, give you the possibility to do deep analysis um, on your data without the need to understand all of the math and kind of put um, some PhD, uh, PhD edit um, and need to write an aggregation for two months. OK. And that's it. So if you've got questions, you can email me. Um, and if you're interested in attack, just um, you can just do a photo. <laughs> Ask myself. That's it. <laughs>